Our worship is about to begin. So let us quiet our hearts to receive our Lord. September 12th 
and we have four possible places for you to volunteer, and they are the Byron Herbert Reese Farm, Young Harris College, the Hinton Center, or Habitat for Humanity. And if you're interested, you can sign up in the narthex or in the hallway. Pam? Thank you. 
special Sunday that we have as we begin off our school year. And we made it, uh, started the time that uh, last year, and uh, you went out and bought hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of school supplies. And this year we had to do it a little different, and you have donated hundreds and hundreds of dollars so that we could go and, and buy these school supplies. Uh, we have several that are within the public school system as well as here at Young Harris. And so we are grateful for each and every one. Uh, I believe right now, Lisa, Sophie, you're the only uh, one here at the early service. So, uh, and uh, Drew, I'm glad you've come today. She has, you know, it's kind of one of those mom things. Uh, I've got a lot of boxes to pick up today. Lisa, one of these big ones is for you, and there are a few more that are in the fellowship hall. Uh, Lisa teaches here uh, in uh, Towns County, and we are grateful for who you are and what you're doing on the front lines and, and ministering to our kids. Uh, we also have a uh, new college professor, though not new to us, uh, Christine McCanchin and her husband Jonathan are part of our church, but Christine is going to be a new adjunct professor teaching uh, Spanish 1 and Spanish 2. And so we have uh, uh, given them a gift as well. We've got uh, Drew Van Horn that we're also recognizing, as well as Paul Arnold and, and Kathy Cease on our uh, Young Harris uh, faculty. So we're grateful for all their work, and we're grateful for the students that have made it on campus and what we're going to do. I, I, right now, Lisa, why don't you just stand where you are and uh, we're going to pray for, for Lisa and uh, pray for the students. Um, tell us, tell me what grade again? First grade. And they're going to be wearing masks, right? Fantastic. A young Harris College student will be with you. Well, let us pray uh, for Lisa and all of our teachers. God, this day we give you thanks for uh, our educators, those mentors, those uh, people that have influenced our lives and guided us into uh, a new uh, field of interest, a, a new way of learning, uh, God, a, a new way of, uh, of living. Lord, we're thankful for those public educators, and uh, Lord God, we are, we are especially grateful for those uh, faith educators, now, those faith leaders and mentors who have uh, communicated the faith to us and taught us about the love of God, that we might uh, follow, learn after you, O oh God, uh, that we might uh, be ourselves uh, a learner and uh, a teacher. God, no matter where you place us in life, help us to always be that good student uh, who follows after you and to be that one who loves and passes on the passion of faith uh, wherever we are. We thank you for new, new visions and we thank you for new beginnings. Uh, bless these teachers and students as they enter in their new year. In Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. There is more in the back, so after the service, I will direct you to several big boxes for, for you. Thank you all for your generous gifts uh, also to make this possible uh, for our teachers. I will tell you this, though, uh, since I will, uh, I need uh, equal opportunity. Uh, Paul is going to be attending. Uh, Paul Arnold is a uh, professor of biology here at Young Harris, and he's, I think, been over 25 years been doing it he loves it uh, but each each time I say you know we're gonna buy something for you what do you want we eventually settled on liquid sanity so what liquid sanity that we've given to him is we've given him some uh, bags of coffee and we've also given him some uh, uh, a big gallon of sanitizer so I hope he will choose appropriately which one that he'll have, uh, he'll use uh, his liquid sanity uh, for. Uh, 
this. I, I want us to think about that a vision, that a vision from God is an opportunity for a new beginning. I want us to think about that when we really seek God, we're seeking a new vision for our life. For God is, is this God who loves us and wants us to know more about who God is in our lives. What's interesting about the scripture today is that the person who very much was a religious fanatic had to say, who are you, Lord? And maybe that's the beginning line for us as we begin this new year, school, that we begin this search for a new vision. It does happen to be one of my favorite songs of which I just, I hear it and it puts me in a place of prayer, of solitude, of listening, and of a cry that says, Lord, you be my vision. We'll sing the first verse. <laughs> Taught us to pray by saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So, yeah, 
Uh, beautiful, the mess we are. Is that what y'all's the words you're saying? You mean you couldn't understand the words? I, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, some songs that my wife says, Stephen, you don't know any of the words. Why are you singing to them? <laughs> well, well appropriate to the scripture today. Because uh, I don't think the, uh, uh, the uh, religious man named Saul was saying, Hallelujah, I'm blind for three days. I, I don't think that came out of his mouth. But I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9, and uh, it's uh, 19b. Somebody asked me, why is it 19b? Well, sometimes uh, the sentences go on, and, and the verses uh, weren't always there, and sometimes the topic changes. So uh, chapter 9 of Acts and uh, begin with 19b. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus. Now this is already after Paul's great uh, episode in Damascus on the way to it. You know, he's blinded. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked his name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, but they were attempting to kill him. When the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up. Living in fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church increased in numbers. Now let's read that story again from Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. So if you're on your Bibles, turn right if you're flipping pages. Otherwise, you can just use your pad and push Galatians. Beginning with verse 13. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had sent me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles. I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him 15 days, but I did not see any other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Sicily, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judah that are in Christ. They only heard it said, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up in response to Revelation. 
Then I lay before them, though only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running, nor had run in vain. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Here is the story of a religious, murderous zealot. And he is headed to Damascus. And there, by, by order of the high priest, he's been given letters to go there and arrest those who are followers of the way. And what he does with them, they really don't care. We already know the story of the stoning of Stephen, in which Saul oversaw that death. Saul was sure of his mission. He was sure of his faith. And he was sure of his religion, that he was faithful. And in a flash of lightning, Saul wasn't so sure anymore. In fact, in that flash of lightning that he experienced on the way to Damascus, he even yells out, Who are you, Lord? You see, he hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Get up and go into the city and you will learn what you are to do. Saul spent three days in Damascus. Then it says he spent three years in Arabia and Damascus. Then it says he spent 14 years before his next trip where he gets with Barnabas to go into Jerusalem the second time. Was Saul an overnight conversion? Probably not. But what we do know is that Saul's reality was rocked in a flash of light. You see, Saul was a religious person. It says that he was well above his age among his peers about his knowledge of the faith of his ancestors. But a new vision was born in a flash of light. A new beginning was born in a flash of light. The old King James Version says that where there is no vision, the people perish. And some of you grew up with that King James, and you've heard that verse before. Where there is no vision, the people perish. In more modern translations, it's, it says where there is no prophecy or where there is no prophetic voice, the people cast off restraint. It's basically saying the same thing. In other words, if you don't have a vision... You could just wander anywhere. If, there's, if you're not guided by a prophetic voice, then you can go off and almost do anything. It won't lead to life. It won't, it won't help you bring guidance to your life and you just cast off all restraints. In other words, you and I need to be guided by a vision or we will perish. You and I need to be guided by a vision or you and I won't find the fullness of life. So how do we get this vision? Is it going to be a flash of light? Is it going to be a way in which someone speak, God speaks to us in a moment? I believe that we find that vision in prayer. And it is the job of every follower of Jesus Christ to see our main job and purpose is to be a people of prayer. You see, when we pray, we begin to learn that we need to be people who listen. And that when we listen, we have the opportunity for someone to change our lives. You see, Jesus prayed, and Jesus lived out his prayers as he heard God's voice for his life. And of all the things that the disciples wanted to learn to do, they said, teach us how to pray. Because they knew that in that, there was a vision that was life-giving. Something about prayer that does connect us with the source of life. A vision that God has. In other words, then when we live out our prayers is that we begin to live out the vision that God has for us. Think about Saul's life again. He's blinded. Did you know that there is actual scientific evidence that a platoon was walking out in that desert between Jerusalem and Damascus? And when lightning struck, there was a man that was blind. One of the army soldiers was blind for 24 hours. 
God uses these incidences of life and turns them to good. And in that instance, Paul, Saul, is now blinded for three days. I don't know if you've had to have your eyes closed or, or that you were quarantined or that you had time on your hands to pray, to think, to reflect. Saul had three days, three days in which he was beginning to open himself up to God again because he thought he knew God. He thought he knew everything that he didn't know about God, but God was going to give him the opportunity for a fresh vision. There are a few times in my life when God's voice has become really clear, and there was one that took place when I was 18 years old. I was 18, and I was ready to go off to college. Even though my, I, my father was a college professor, they did not lead or push or prod me in going to college at all, surprisingly enough. But nonetheless, I quickly filled out transcripts. I quickly got everything together, and I had some options in front of me. One was to go to the local United Methodist College that was right there where I'd grown up. And then there were a few others that were out there. And a voice came to me as clear as any voice I've ever heard. And it said this, Stephen, if you're going to grow up, you need to go elsewhere. Surprising, that voice hit me again after I graduated from college. And the easy road would have been going to Perkins School of Theology where all my friends were going to seminary. And that voice was just the same and just as clear. Stephen, if you're going to grow up, you need to go elsewhere. It's amazing how that God is the God who wants to intervene into our lives when we pray, when we listen, when we read the scriptures, when we say, Lord, who are you and what do I need to do with my life? Because God is the lover of those who are lost and uncertain and alone, confused and frightened. God is even the lover of those who are arrogant and disrespectful. And so God leads us to be a people of prayer, to read the scriptures, and to learn more about Jesus. Do you imagine that Paul in his arrogance and in his disrespect of other people's understanding of God, that Paul just became in that moment just a little more humble in his own life? And then maybe his prayers began, who are you, Lord, to, Lord, I guess I don't know you as well as I should. And then Paul began to spend time in, in quiet, in prayer, and to hear God's voice of love and grace in his life. I know for me, with each, each mentor that I've had, those that I've read and those that have been in person, how they've stretched me into a new vision. How they've stretched me into a new beginning. How they've stretched to, for me to become a new me. Someone who's more patient. Someone who's more compassionate. Someone who spends more time in prayer. Someone who gets better at loving people. Saul was a death-dealing Person, and he became a Holy Spirit saving person. He had a mission of death, and then he had a mission of life. He had a mission, a ministry of hate, and it became a ministry of love and grace. I'd say he got a new vision, he got a new reality. He changed his life because God intervened and he heard the voice that God wants us to have as far as having a new vision. A new vision for each and every one of us here. A vision that changes our life, changes our vision. One that changes and renews us because of God's refreshing spirit. I am not the same person that I used to be because Jesus Christ lives more fully in me. It was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, 
I may not be the man I, I ought to be. I may not be the man I want to be. I may not be the man I should be, but I thank God I'm not the man that I used to be. And I'm not. Sometimes I'm almost embarrassed by the thought of talking to former classmates of mine in high school and thinking how childish, thinking how juvenile, thinking how immature I was. I thank God that God has intervened in, in my life. And sometimes it might have been for us or for you or for me a flash of light like lightning. Or maybe it was this idea as a flash of a light bulb that came to us. But new vision and new beginnings offer all of us the chance to be different and to be changed. That we begin to ask in our prayers, Lord, open my eyes that I may see. Open my heart that I may really have more room for you in my life. Lord, open my life that I truly might be more of yours. Saul was changed, but it wasn't overnight. But that vision led him for the rest of his days. That vision changed his heart, but his heart took some time. I believe God wants to take that time with each and every one of us, no matter where we are. Because I guess that we are that beautiful mess that sometimes is better than a hallelujah. Because God can finally break through into our lives and give us that vision of what we may need today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our last hymn is Open My Eyes That I May See. If you today here have never made that profession of faith or if you wish to come and join this church today, I would invite you to come as we stand and sing our final hymn. We'll do all three verses of Open My Eyes and Come Back.
pray. Lord, we do not know you as we should. Even at times when we think we do. So silently and quietly, oh God, in our times of prayer, we open our heart, eyes, and ears to you. That you might show us, that you might tell us, and that you might equip us to live out the life that you want us to live that honors you and glorifies your name. And as you have changed each and every one of us, may your world change as you so desire. Give us that vision that you so loved the world that you gave Jesus. Let us so love the world the same. And give ourselves as we learn more about Jesus. In his name we pray, God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm glad you come today. Um, I honestly don't know what's going to happen if we get feedback that uh, they didn't understand what you said in your singing. But nice wig. <laughs> It just goes to show that for any of us, you come as you are. And if you need to wear a blonde wig to, to, to be opera Pam, then come join us. Uh, we're excited about college students. We love young Harris, and we welcome y'all and want to do everything we can. Recognize that you have a home here, and uh, you've got a source of, of helping you in whatever you want. Uh, we have a gift for you on the way out because you've come. Uh, may you have a great week of classes. We certainly will remember you in prayers. As always, please let the ushers escort you out. Please wear a mask if you're not drinking. If you're uh, dr drinking some of the refreshments outside, then stand further apart than six feet away from each other. May God bless you with love. May God bless you with the vision that it begins and helps you to start a new life in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Amen.